Welcome to episode 182 of Stageworthy. I'm your host, Phil Rickaby. Stageworthy is a podcast about people in Canadian theatre featuring conversations with actors, directors, playwrights, and more. I want to take another chance to tell you about Got Your Back Canada. Got Your Back invites all acting teachers to attend their Acting Educators Conference on May 27th to 28th, 2019. Whether you work as part of an institution, as a private coach, or someone who's interested in pursuing acting education, this conference is your opportunity to meet other passionate and dedicated teachers and learn some new techniques and practices to bring to the classroom. The conference will explore exciting new ideas and tools around anti-oppression, harassment, and mental health. For more information, visit gybaactingeducators.com or search Got Your Back Canada. Let's take another second to talk about Today Ticks. Today Ticks is an app and a website that offers easy and affordable access to a wide variety of must-see cultural performances from plays and musicals to dance, opera, comedy, immersive experience, and beyond. Let's take a look at the Today Ticks app and see what we have this week. Uh, this week, there is a deal for 15% off tickets for Beautiful Man at Factory Theatre. And appropriate for today's conversation with Judith Thompson, $20 rush tickets for Rare Theatre's Welcome to My Underworld. There are also rush tickets for 887 at the Canadian Stage. Today Tix makes ticket buying simple and you can purchase tickets in less than 30 seconds. Get it on iOS and Android or go to todaytix.com. If you want to drop me a line, remember that you can find Stageworthy on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website at StageworthyPodcast.com. And if you want to drop me a line, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Phil Rickaby, and my website is PhilRickaby.com. My guest this week is, as I mentioned, acclaimed Canadian playwright, director, actor, professor of theatre at the University of Guelph, and the artistic director of Rare Theatre, Judith Thompson. Judith is directing Rare Theatre's Welcome to My Underworld in the Tank House Theatre at the Young Centre for the Performing Arts from May 8th to 25th in Toronto. So I wanted to 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 just sort of jump in and start talking about before we get into anything else. I do want to make sure that we talk about Welcome to My Underworld. So I Please, want to know. Yeah. Let's start with like can, what what can you tell me about Welcome to My Underworld? Well, first that I think I'm more excited about this than anything I've done in a very long time because it's nine extraordinary playwrights, new playwrights. Uh, they are all theater practitioners, and for most of them, they've had at least one professional production, but they mm -hmm. range. I have an 89-year-old who's been an actress for uh, 70 years. Oh, wow. And she's written her first play, or second play. Um, they are it's an incredibly diverse group. And I happened upon them, found them here and there, and they're writing, and we've been working on it all year. I'm just a dramaturge. Mm. And uh, the writing is precise, it's insightful, it's, it's new in the sense that new ways of seeing the world that we hahaven't mm. seen before, new languages. And mm. then my task as a dramaturge is to thread them so that it, there's one voyage, one st they're, they're threaded together by one of the pieces that I put in between each one uh, to make one story. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, the 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 putting them all together into one story. Did you did you find that there were uh, similar themes, or did you were they given the task of of putting those together in a single well, theme? Well, yeah. When I, how when did I, you manage that? Well, when I read their first drafts, I saw, oh my god, they all have the theme of the shadow self. Each one there's a shadow and they dive into it and it's a sort of mm. other darker self that we all experience. Mm. And uh, then, so I said, work with that, go even mm. farther with that. And, uh, and then that, from that came the concept of welcome to my underworld because through exploring the shadow self, which is not necessarily darker, it's just the shadow self, mm -hmm. uh, you find more light and you find out who you are. Mm -hmm. And it all is the search for the self, which, as you know, is a, a lifetime search. Oh, sure. 
Yeah. Now, in terms of finding these playwrights, how did how did they all how did all nine pieces come to you? It's uh, you know, I saw three at a an event, a sort of playwright performer event. I uh, found another was a master's student of mine, and I found her writing incredible. Mm. Uh, someone, my general manager suggested someone, and I said, oh, you know, he's extraordinary. Can he write? And then he submitted something, and I said, yes. And it's sort of like that, just uh, higgledy-piggledy, but they were all, it's mm. all writing that knocks me out because I'm, I, I think that it's the playwrights, it's so important that the playwrights of the future are, recognized, mm. encouraged, put out there, more than just encouraged, because they are major voices, all of them. Mm -hmm. And I think that people are, diversity in casting is happening, and that is wonderful, but we're not really uh, affirming diversity in our country until it's about the writers, because the writers have the ideas, the concepts, the politics, and the language, mm. and, and, and the actors interpret and serve that, as does the director. We need the writers to be front and center, and that's why I'm doing this. No, you're very right. I mean, it, it is, it is, we, there's a lot of, a lot of, I don't want to say lip service, but there's a lot of effort to put uh, diverse uh, faces and people on stages. But when we look at a lot of the, the, the seasons uh, for a lot right. of theaters, they do tend to be a bunch of a bunch of you know specifically white men but just a lot of a lot of Caucasian people absolutely you know? no yeah. and it's got to be in the writing and in these mm -hmm. pieces you experience nine cultures nine perspectives nine ways of expressing mm. the english language and so mm. that and then and then to make it an evening so it's not just a festival of one act plays which would be fine but mm. i just want to set myself a great big task and i i think we've been able to do it Sure, I do think that there's something to be said for for uh, some kind of unifying factor. It is fine, and it can be entertaining to see an evening of of one act plays, uh, but I think that an audience sort of finds themselves sort of stopping and starting. Exactly, when that happens, it's kind of a jolt, and if they can feel like they're getting one story, then yeah. they're more satisfied as an audience and more exactly. they, they've had an evening. Yeah, and that's why I chose the piece that is a young girl's um, search for whether she's human or not. And she has an imaginary mm -hmm. friend. And so it's, it's sort of, it's not light, but it is uplifting. And it's a child's um, faith and, and dedication mm -hmm. to this task. And they all sort of serve her. She, she wraps them together in the most beautiful way. And of course, seven of them are actors as well. So mm -hmm. to see the ensemble helping each other, guiding each other, working together is really, really beautiful. We've had a, a mm. workshop, so I, I've begun to yeah. see it. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, now, are you saying that, that, that seven of the, of the writers are actors? That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, there is something about the actor who also writes. I think that an actor who writes has a particular perspective That's on, right. on putting words to paper. Yeah. We, we know what's actable. And we know mm -hmm. when when silences are even more powerful, and we know when a monologue mm -hmm. is a is a fountain pouring out. And um, I, I that's where I came from. I came from um, you know I was a big reader, but I came from acting. I graduated from the National Theatre School in acting, uh, but I turned to writing, and I found that's where I felt the strongest, and that's where I felt I was the most needed, actually. Well, I, I would have actually really liked to talk about about the road to writing, but before we get to to writing. I do want to talk about how you found your way to theater school. What, what, how did you um, get into theater? Well, actually, when I, my mother was involved in theater, and when I was 11, um, she was directing uh, Helen, this Helen Keller story. I can't remember mm -hmm. what it's actually called about the teacher. Is that the miracle, miracle worker? worker? Yeah, yeah. And so I got to play Helen Keller when I was 11. Oh, okay. And um, I had great fun with that able to take tantrums on stage and scream mm -hmm. and it was great. Yeah. And, then, and then I, we moved to Kingston, Ontario, and then I was in the crucible. And an interesting story is I was 12 and I was, you know, Betty, I uh, remember the play opens with, is my Betty going to be hardy soon? And Betty says, I want to fly. I want to fly. And so I was Betty and I screamed a blood curdling scream, which was great fun. And who I played with 
was the brilliant actress Carolyn Hetherington, who at the time was in her 30s, and she's my 89-year-old writer now. Oh, that's so amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so at what point did you, I mean, this is you. This is like some, some really early, early acting. At what point did you decide that that was going to be where you focused your life and you were going to go to theater school? I, I think really after playing Betty in The Crucible, and then I, I was Sandy in the prime of Miss Jean Brody. I was in um, Dark at the Top of the Stairs, a wonderful uh, ignored play from the 50s. And uh, it just in the, and then in, at Queen's, I was also in a lot. <laughs> And uh, it was just my path. And it's funny, I didn't even take playwriting. There was a, a very good playwriting prof, but uh, mm. I didn't hear, hear how, is how we were colonized though. We were mm. colonized in that all the plays were American or British. I think we looked oh, at sure. one, one Robertson Davies sort of romp, which wasn't anywhere near the writing of Fifth Business or anything like that. And, and it was almost all male. And mm. so it didn't occur to me that I could have the agency that, that what I said could matter. And that's what I want to do with these writers. What you say matters, really matters, and can have a global isn't that, impact. Isn't that interesting that, that um, you know, again, coming back to where the words come from, that that affects how other people see what they can do? Yes. Like you not seeing that, that, that a playwright can, can be a woman or a person of color not seeing that a playwright can be a person of color affects what they think a playwright can be. Exactly. And who can be a playwright? And so, no, no, my job was to serve. And, and I went to theater. And, and so, you know, I auditioned for the theater school and got in. And, uh, you know, we were a great class with uh, Nancy Pock and Joe Ziegler and Shauna McKenna and Barbara Duncan. And uh, there were many more wonderful students who unfortunately were asked to leave and shouldn't have been. I think that's mm. a huge, huge mistake. Um, I think that is a that is that is a frequent issue at, at theater yeah. schools or has been for yeah. for quite a long time. Yeah, I hope they're not doing it as much unless somebody arrives drunk or late all the time. Mm -hmm. or, you know, but yes. that wasn't the case at all. Mm. Uh, and I think a, a very cynical thing, a very, and also extremely hurtful to the people. They never forget mm -hmm. it, actually. No, of course they don't. No, yeah. I know people who who went to theater school who were who were asked to leave, and they're still they they have never gotten over that. No, it's still no. a defining pain in their life. Exactly, and it's so meaningless. And when you yeah. you know later on you look at who the instructors were, and you think, really, I took this mm. person seriously. Well, it's also, I know that there's a lot of people who, like in my class, when I was in theater school, there are people who were, we call them the golden children, but they were the ones that was assumed that they That's would right. succeed. Yes. And so many of them are not even doing it. Like five years after they graduated, they're not even doing it anymore. That, that is very true. I've seen that as well. It's, you think, what's he doing? Oh, he's in Minnesota being a waiter or something. You know, it's, yeah. yeah. It's a, uh, and they're this golden thing. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So, where I started to really feel alive was in improvising and in doing mask work. And that was my own words. They say, find a monologue for your mask. And I actually couldn't find anything. So, I wrote it myself. Mm -hmm. And, and the wonderful teacher, Pierre Lefebvre, who also taught at, at Juilliard and in France as well was so encouraging and inspiring and, and taught mm. with kindness and excitement rather than fear, which is, as you know, a lot of theater school teachers, it's about fear. I and, think that's changing, but yeah, I do. I certainly recall that. Yeah, I think it is changing. And there's, you know, Alyssa at uh, National Theater School is wonderful, and I'm sure she has changed things there for sure. And I know George mm -hmm. Brown has mm -hmm. changed. And yeah. um, But anyway, then there was that was the climate. Mm -hmm. And uh so that, and then we'd have these Friday evenings where we perform for our peers. And it was really my peers uh, mm. that, that excited me doing this kind of work. And so right after I graduated, I did have a couple of acting jobs right away, but I began writing The Crap Walker. Then. And so you, you went from, from, from creating, improvising your own monologues for your masks to, um, to, to writing The Crap Walker. Yes, because one of the mm. characters was Teresa. In the, mm. in the crack walker, okay. yeah, one okay. of the mass characters. Hmm. Well, I mean, it, one of the interesting things that that I've been thinking of is that um, the the you have okay, thinking about the crack walker and a number of other plays, um, your characters are really diverse and they're passionate, but a lot of them are also kind of deviant or just sort of outside of of society. 
So how is you write them really well. So how do you dig into that place and tap into those voices so well? That's a great question, because especially in the current climate where we are asking, is it my story to tell? And I support that. I absolutely do. On the other hand, like say the crack walker, for instance, uh, I mix things up and the character of Teresa was not like the person whose child was killed at all. But, it, but, you know, I felt that I wasn't writing that story. And then the, the baby, the child asserted himself, really, I wasn't planning on it and it happened on the page mm. and I realized this story must be told. Otherwise it's mm. buried and it's hidden. And mm. none of the social workers who were present at the time are going to tell it because it uh, brings shame. Mm. And certainly the people who had do not have the privilege of education or being able to read or write, they're not going to tell it. So mm. I felt I was leaving because I, I had that job, uh, you know, just as a mm. student. And I thought I have to tell the world. That's that's my job to to tell people. But then I look at Palace of the End, which is probably my most produced play. And uh, do I have the right to tell Lindy England's story and, in fact, name her Lindy England, the young private who had, was famous for the thumbs up with the Iraqi detainees in Abu Ghraib? Mm -hmm. uh, do I have the right to tell the story of the Iraqi woman who was a real woman uh, who she and her husband were the leaders of the Communist Party, and her baby boy was tortured to death by um, Saddam Hussein's secret police. Uh, my neighbor, who's Iraqi, translated from the Arabic that that mm -hmm. that that account, which is real. And I didn't mm -hmm. write a thing down. I came home and I wrote it. But I have to say, immodestly, that it works. I know it works, and I was able mm -hmm. to channel them. So I, th I think the truth is, if you can really do the research, and as well as massive amounts of research, and then you can also channel, it's not enough just to do the research, because then you can you just mm -hmm. write a very research focused, you have to be able to channel like an actor does exactly as a playwright, so that it is flowing out of you. And it's almost... Mm, there's almost something psychic going on. There's almost something mm -hmm. it's she's speaking through me here. And uh, in fact, many Iraqi people came to has have come to the show and have given it their approval. Very much wanted that story mm. told. So, so I'm still nervous about it now, though. You know, I don't think mm. I'd I'd write someone else's story now, but I don't want to write my own story. It would bore everybody to death. So, <laughs> well, I mean, thinking about about writing other people's uh, you know, quote unquote other people's stories. I mean, I think that there has been in the years since it premiered some criticism of the Crackwalker, and I don't know. Um, I mean, I haven't really delved into that, but I know a few, I, I just saw a couple of, of reviews from the remount in 2013 that were oh, yeah, yeah. some of those. And, yeah. and, and I wonder, um, it's sort of a difficult question because to ask a playwright if, if, if they would do something differently or if they, um, have other like second thoughts about a particular play is not really a fair thing, but, um, how do you feel? Have you do you feel like the Crackwalker in modern times is judged unfairly, or do you think that the story is worth is still worth uh, being told? Well, certainly a lot of people are still doing it and uh, are dedicated no, to true. it. And, and uh, you know, my remount, I was very very proud of because I did have to address the problem of of the indigenous man who was mm -hmm. it simply wasn't on my radar. I was just writing what I saw. And uh, mm -hmm. this time, because I had Wabate Fobister, um and uh, Leolanda Bunnell as advisors mm -hmm. and consultants, that I realized mm -hmm. that's what the crack walker was, is, is mm -hmm. what, what the, we, the oppressors, have done to the mm -hmm. indigenous people. And it's our terror of, of payback, of what we mm -hmm. have done, our guilt. That's mm. what plagues us. And so mm. there were, there may have been criticism. I don't read reviews. I don't care. I couldn't care less about them. Mm. But uh, certainly there were many people who were extremely enthusiastic about that. And I felt, oh, I felt safe because mm -hmm. I trusted my advisors and they were indigenous. So. I think, I mean, if you, if you bring on the right people, I think that, that, you know, if you bring on people who can be advisors, I know, um, I was talking last year with with Kat Sandler and her dramaturg about her play Bang Bang, right? And and she, you know, she worried about 
writing in the voice of a person of color, but she was, she had a very good dramaturg who really challenged her Yeah, and she was willing to take it. And I think that's sort of an important mark of the playwright writing quote unquote, somebody else's story to listen and to, to take the criticism and to be able to push yourself further. Uh, listen, do journalists tell other people's stories? Of course they Absolutely. do. They Absolutely. They have to. Yeah. What I am is a creative journalist. Okay. And, yeah, and yeah, also, yeah. here's an irony. If, with, if people did criticize my choice to have Indigenous uh, people in the crack walker, for years I've been criticized because they've said, well, Teresa is an Indigenous woman. Why have you never had an Indigenous actress play her? Well, because mm. I was scared that uh, well, also I don't control all the productions, obviously, sure. but uh, I would, would be nervous that people say, oh, you have a, a, a woman who is, um, has me- had mental challenges and she's mm-hmm. indigenous. Well, who do you think you are? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah um, no. So that's it's sort of, it is sort of a, yeah, it is sort of a, a lose lose situation there yeah. where you can't, you know, you can't quite, you, you can't please everybody. But also Yolanda was, at, was by far the best actor. I had lots, auditioned mm. lots mm-hmm. of people and she mm. got it and she was it and defined it. And I really didn't even need to give her any acting direction. She was just all over mm. it. And then I, nice. I realized more about the character because of her. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for answering those questions. Yeah. Um, um, when did you turn to teaching playwriting? When did that become something that you were doing? Um, I think that was in 1993. I was hired after, shortly after the uh, line in the streets at, uh, mm-hmm. and the crack walker were together at Tarragon in 1990. Mm-hmm. And, uh, a prof named Rick Knowles, uh, sort of shadowed me and wrote about the process, my process of rewriting and workshopping. And then, um, mm-hmm. he and Connie Rook and the Dean, and they wanted, um, to hire me. So, did when you when you started teaching like I don't know if somebody came to me and asked me if I would start teaching something I probably feel I'd be really frightened to be honest with you um like what what you know what do I know that that that, that I could impart to them was there ever did you ever wonder about about teaching or was did you take to it like right away well i mean there are several reasons i i I feel honored to share what i do know and what i've been doing and i teach playwriting acting uh, devising, um, all of mm. it. Um, so I certainly have trained for it all. And mm. also to nurture young writers is, uh, what a joy to see mm. and uh, writers and actors to, you know, what you see in a little classroom somewhere, you know, 70 kilometers from here, sometimes mm. is some of the best work I've ever seen. Mm. And that's so exciting. I mean, you 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 mentioned like just you know seventy seventy kilometers away. I mean, we if you people who live in the Toronto area tend to be a little bit um, Toronto centric, and they won't travel the half hour to Hamilton or someplace yeah. like that. Have you managed to to? I mean, you said like seventy kilometers away. Do you get out to see a lot, or not as much as you'd like? What do you mean? Oh, like like getting to getting out of Toronto to see theater. Do you oh, do you get no. to see a lot, no. or do you no? No, I, I I mean I live here and I teach in Guelph. Mm. So the two days I teach, we drive there, we drive back, and mm. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, if my students are doing something, of course I'll go back for it. Yeah, but that, that's mm. my job too. That's you know, it's sure. purpose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of your I. I the, one of the things that it sounds like you really enjoy is 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 nurturing uh, young playwrights. Is there something that you is there like a a number one lesson that you would want to impart to a young playwright? Well, yes. What I say is that they value your own stories, your own settings, where you are from, the people around you, because that is automatically universal in its specificity. And I noticed often young playwrights initially, there were like in one of my last playwriting classes, about half of them, their first drafts all took place in the United States. Hmm. And I'd say, oh, did you live in Seattle? No, I've never been there. Why does it take place there? Because they're not valuing. They're, we are still so colonized that these young people mm-hmm. are not valuing Fergus, Ontario, or Timmins, or wherever they are from. And uh, we don't even yeah. really 
a lot of a lot of times people are, are afraid to write that a play or even a movie or TV show or book that it takes place in Toronto or yeah or even uh, even Toronto yeah I know and they and also young actors go oh I want Broadway and I say well actually you know most of the shows in Toronto are actually better than they are on Broadway oh no no they can't <laughs> they can't even believe it you know no of course they can't because they've we they've they've been conditioned to believe yeah. that that broadway is where the best is a- absolutely you say no honestly you, if you go see evan hansen you know in the canadian mm-hmm. cast you will see uh mm-hmm. yeah it's good on broadway and it's just as good or better here yeah well that's the thing is like what what the only difference is the myth of broadway completely as opposed to the reality of the theater that we have here oh it's the best in the world i think we there's no question mm-hmm. we have the best uh, writers and actors uh, in the world in the English, English loved, speaking world, <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, I mean, I'm not as familiar with with the the French speaking yeah. uh, 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 theater that happens in Quebec, not being bilingual. Um, but I think it is there is something like watching and getting the opportunity to see a lot of the indie theater in Toronto, which is always really exciting to watch somebody like Kat Sandler, who started producing on her own Amazing. And, yeah. and has just managed to come through that and is now, I mean, last year she had a show at Factory and a show at Terry yeah. overlapping at the same time, which yeah. is an amazing thing to see happen. Yeah. Um, did you, I mean, just thinking about the like not seeing a woman's voice as a playwright when you were in theater school um and 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 now people are starting to see their own voices do you i mean how do you impart that knowledge to 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 students to say your voice is as important as somebody from america well i say it in those words pretty well you know and Mm. write them long responses and tell them how exciting (laughs) the parts that are original and are authentic and a real R that have a. a, Do you get a lot of, do you get a lot of pushback on that originally? Like when you first bring it up, people don't, can't believe it. Well, about the setting. Are they grateful to hear that their voices matter? Well, at first one about the settings. And I said, I'm sorry, I, for, you know, none of you, unless you've lived in the, in the place that you're writing about, I, you have to take, it has to take place here Mm -hmm. because we Mm -hmm. audiences want generally apart from the classics, we do want to see the sort of (laughs) under, the surface reality of our lives reflected on the stage. Mm. And, and place names are key to that. Well, I do you think that's really important that we do, that we do see those, that we do, we see ourselves. And isn't that what, what the arts, what theater is meant to do is to help us to see ourselves. Yeah, because life goes by so fast that it's like suddenly mm-hmm. isolating moments. Like say you write a divorce mm-hmm. play or something and, so many people's parents have divorced or they have themselves and think, well, how did it happen? When was the moment? And it's sometimes impossible other than adultery, I guess, to pinpoint. And then that's a play, that's a playwright's job. Mm. And then the actors inhabit that to say, okay, stop. Yeah. Oh, it was here. There was the first hint. There was the moment. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Can I ask you about your your writing process? Like as as a writer myself, I'm always fascinated by the way that 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 people write. Are do you do you plan things out or do you let the pen take you where it goes and fix it later? What's how do ideas come and how do they end up on the page? I, I've done both. Uh, in my most recent sort of play that I wrote on my own, which it was Who Killed Snow White, which was at fourth line this summer. Uh, I had an idea, which again, whose story, who is it my story to tell, based mm-hmm. on, uh, inspired by terrible tragedies like that of Retea Parsons, Amanda Todd, mm-hmm. these young girls mm-hmm. who were s- sexually assaulted, cyber bullied, and then mm-hmm. took their lives. Mm-hmm. And I thought this story has to be told. They have to be told in, this is the way I can tell it. Mm. and I'm a woman, and I think I can. I know I can, and I did, mm-hmm. and uh, I found a way. That was hard, to find the way, rather than just a uh, TV movie of the week, you know, yeah. from A to B to C. I realized, okay, I'm a mother. It has to be, and I need a 
Greek tragic element to it. So it's more than a naturalistic piece. And, and it's from the mother's perspective, but she doesn't know everything that went on. She's a mother. We're not there all the time. So all you can do is reconstruct or yeah. from what people have told you, what you imagine. And she tells the audience that and said, you're going to come on this journey with me. And she imagines revenge against the boys and her hands with blood. Mm. And that's the, the Greek elements. And there was a water mm. and there was a white horse. I mean, the fourth line is so amazing because, you know, I had my <laughs> protagonist ride in on a white horse for the hills and, mm. and, a, and a red truck right on stage, which when they took her off and it, incredible. And a pond she mm. drowned herself in, but then didn't and emerged at the end. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it, it's some, I mean, when you when you are right. Yeah. No. Go well, ahead. Sometimes I plan it. I had a, I had actually the play that was called Hot House that I did in Kingston under a commission, and commissions are very different. They're interesting. I don't think we can ever fully um, be ourselves in a commission. Hmm. It's an, because it's an assignment, and you want to do so well, and and you're thrilled right. to have a commission. That's wonderful. Every writer should, but there's something mm. that it's puts a lid on you somehow, even if they say, oh, whatever you want. Mm. Anyway, it was a commission and I had figured out the structure first and it's the first time I did it. And I, I don't, it was a good play and beautifully directed by Catherine McKay. And it really did well in Kingston, that gorgeous Isabel Botter theater. But, um, I felt it was not one of my best, you know, it was, it was mm. okay. It was good. It was a B plus, you know, but it wasn't. Mm. Yeah. And I felt partly cause it was an assignment and because I over, I structured it right. too, too well. Oh, too, too structured. Yeah. I, I figured out okay. the structure okay. first rather than letting oh, the okay. characters drive the structure and then, mm. and then sculpting and revising. Mm. And, yeah. Right. Um, when you are writing, and here we're talking about this play that has a white horse and a pond and a, <laughs> a truck on stage and all of those things. When you're writing, do you do you ever censor the things that like, do you ever think that's way outside anybody's budget? Or do you just write it and say, they're going to deal with it. They'll figure out how to do oh, it. Our designers are so extraordinary that you can, you know, even if it was in the backspace <laughs> at Pass Mirai, they mm. could have given me some version you know, if it's just sparkly material of the pond, yes, the horse, yeah. the truck, <laughs> it could be a sound That's effect true. and a light, you know, That's they can true. do it. They're amazing. That's true. And in the backspace, I remember, oh, I didn't remember what the show is. I saw a show there years ago where they actually had a pool. That's hilarious. That you could dive into. No, really? In in the backspace amazing. at Theater Pass Mirage. Hilarious. Wow. So apparently you can do anything. Incredible. It's one of the things because I often like wonder as I'm writing, and I, it, it's an effort to to talk myself out of writing something too big, thinking that it's oh nobody can produce this. There's too many characters. There's there's, right. uh, there's no way that I can put that on stage. And I think that that's a danger that those of us who write and often self produce end up self editing in a way that maybe we should. It's true. On the other hand, I will, if I'm mentoring a writer, I, uh, because I teach at the MFA at Guelph as well. So these are quite advanced uh, writers, you know, who will mm -hmm. get productions. And I will say, well, I hope your actors can double or triple because mm -hmm. unless you can get a huge grant, it's mm -hmm. just not going to, it's caught salaries are just too much. It's just because, you know, as, yeah. as the artistic director of rare theater, um, and my wonderful general manager helps me. It, we know how much it costs mm -hmm. and it's very hard. And it, you know, you, how big is your house? Are you going to sell out every night? You know, not necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can I ask about what are the origins of, of rare? How did, how did rare theater get started? Well, how it started uh, originally I was commissioned by Dove of all, I suddenly got a phone call and it was the people who were advertising for Dove and they said, Hey, would you uh, consider creating a play with 14 women who are not actors about aging and beauty? And I said, Oh, hmm. that's interesting. I said, cause I already was very interested in non actor, like the, the kind of beautiful naturalness and awkwardness of a non actor on stage interested me. And in film, certainly it can work. And uh, I said, well, as long as there's absolutely no advertising um, in the content, and they said, no, none at all. 
And I said, great. I mean, that sounds amazing. And so they flew in act- mm. uh, women from all over the country, from like northern BC, none of it, literally everywhere. And mm. uh, we had 14 women and it was a huge, and it, they told their stories and I curated and edited and directed and a very diverse group. And there were people lining up around the block on blankets, like, and, and then we took it to the Vancouver uh, cultural mm. aspect of the Olympics and people went nuts, nuts for it. And mm. I realized there is such power here in people telling their own stories. So then, um, you know, I, I uh, had a family member who, who had a chronic illness and I thought a lot of young people must uh, have these invisible sort of illnesses. And I, I sort of advertised that if you're under 25 and um, not under 12, come on out for next stage and got a great group. Mm. And um, uh, we, it was called Sick and it was a really powerful production. And one of the people in it was Crystal Nussbaum who has Down syndrome. And one day I was meeting with she and her mom and I said, you know what, you're an organized lady. If you could organize it and we get into the fringe, I'd love to do a show with a cast of people with Down syndrome telling their stories. Mm. And that became rare, which Right. Uh, was a huge hit at Soul Pepper, extended right. three or four times, sold out every night. We toured it, and that was the beginning. And then we created the company. Nice. Nice. Uh, what, what was it? So when you, after that, when did you decide or how did you decide that you were going to make the company a, a, like a permanent thing and not just a, a single show thing? Well, we hoped it, it would be. And also it's my way of giving back because although I dramaturge, edit, etc., like these are not Judith Thompson plays, you know, they're, mm. they're the, uh, another road, I guess. I'm involved and it's my concept, but it's their stories and their words. And that's really important to me. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, we veered from that slightly, but uh, I want to be able to have communities that have been basically ignored, not seen Mm -hmm. or heard, uh, represented by themselves, nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, that's what we've been doing. And I learned so much from it. And Born was nine wheelchair users who, uh, incredible what they did. Hmm. Um, I guess the, the, like the whole uh, having all of these different voices telling their own stories sort of does tie back into where uh, 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 the, the, the uh, Welcome to My Underworld comes from. Because you have all these nine voices yeah. um, doing doing the same sort of thing. Yeah, and some of the stories are personal and some are not, but they all come from that well of, the, of, of experience. Hmm. Hmm. And they all have their own uh, language in an interesting way, which is so exciting. Hmm. And so is, is, are, I, I imagine rehearsals are, are, are in force now? They're, no, they begin April 9th, next, next April a week 9th? today, okay. a week today. Okay. Yeah. So you've just, you've had a workshop, but rehearsals are, are starting next yeah, week we had a workshop. as we record. Yeah. And I have been meeting with the writers all year, uh, in mm-hmm. dramaturgy sessions and they've been wonderfully responsive and, and yeah, it's just been great. What excites you most about getting welcome to my underworld to the stage? Exactly what we just talked about getting these voices <laughs> that mm. have not well, barely been heard out there into mm. the world, penetrating people's conscience, consciousness, actually shifting mm. the way we experience the world. Hmm. Judith, thank you so much for doing this. I really thank appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a joy. This has been a Homebody Productions production.